All right, so now we are at uh, chapter 7 of V, which is called, uh, subtitled, She Hangs on the Western Wall. And this is a reference not only to uh, the birth of Venus in the Uffizi, which hangs on the Western Wall, uh, which they're going to, there's a plot to uh, kidnap the painting in this, but it also refers to the West Wall of Chartres Cathedral, whereon uh, there are stained glass images of the Virgin. Uh, one in particular shows the Virgin on the tree of Jesse, which is the old genealogical tree that connects Christ all the way back through uh, the line back to uh, Jesse, uh, which we'll have an analog here, as we'll see with the Judas tree, that they hollow out so that they can roll up uh, the birth of Venus, Botticelli's painting, and, and put it inside the Judas tree. Um, <clears throat> this is a very long chapter, and it's one of the longest and most complex in the book, and also one of the best. It reads, in a way, like a miniature novel unto itself. Um, and so it begins, uh, we're, we're in 1955 here, we're in the month of April still, and um, Stencil, Herbert uh, Stencil, is now going to visit the dentist, uh, a man named Dudley Eigenvalue, and we get at first him pacing in his office, uh, and he has this little museum of uh, curiosities, of, de of the history of dentistry, and in one of the cases he has a, um, a, a set of um, teeth, uh, like dentures almost, except that all the teeth in it are made of a different precious metal. Um, one of them is uh, titanium, uh, so d different precious metals. And we don't know who it's come from, but we do su suspect, as we will confirm at some point, that it's connected with V's descent into the inanimate. So then he goes out into his office to meet Herbert Stencil, and he's like, this guy keeps coming here, uh, pumping me for information, looking for this V character, and uh, as He's looking, you know, it's, he's looking in places where it's just a waste of time. But he goes out to meet him in the office and he invites him back into his uh, back office and they sit and talk for a bit. Uh, and he tells him, uh, Stencil tells him that he uh, wants to talk about uh, his father, Sidney Stencil's first meeting with Victoria Wren. And then that becomes the introduction that sets everything up here uh, for uh, the sequence of sub -check chapters. And there are 11 of them to follow. Eigenvalue goes through and shows him his little museum of uh, dentistry, curiosities, um, different types of uh, ways of dealing with dentistry. Um, and then we get to, so that sets it up, uh, and then we get to Florence in 1899, which now is the main story of the chapter, which takes place one year after. So Victoria Wren, this is, I think, almost the only other occurrence in the novel where she has the same name. And two different stories. Um, Victoria Wren is here in Florence in 1899 where she's gone to set up a couturier's shop. So she wants to make uh, fashionable clothing. Uh, so this is a year before that as we saw during the Fashoda crisis she was present in Egypt. Um, so and now she has moved uh, to Florence. And then uh, as we first see her she's walking about uh, thinking these thoughts to herself. She's thinking about her Roman Catholicism. She's thinking about the fact also too that She's had four lovers at this point. She's 19 years old, and Goodfellow, as we saw, uh, had deflowered her, and that was the first of her lovers, and she had realized uh, that he was a spy, and it began to interest her in espionage, but only in a vague way at that point. Um, and that she'd had three other lovers that she had gotten money from, who knows how, uh, to pay for this couturier shop that she's come to Florence to open. And we noticed that in her hair, uh, Pynchon is really good with all these little details. I love all these little objects and details that in her hair she's got an ivory comb that happens to be made out of five crucified British soldiers. They're not Christ's, which is interesting, but they're in a row sharing a sort of common arm. Um, and there's five of them uh, with pith helmets and so forth. And they, and they, they represent uh, British uh, soldiers who were crucified by the Mahdi in Khartoum when the British... Uh, and it was 1881 to 83, uh, tried to take Khartoum, and they had to fight the, the Mahdi, and he had apparently some of them crucified. So there's this comb in her hair, and she's thinking about four lovers, and so one wonders about uh, if these lovers somehow, in Pynchon's mind, correspond to these crucified individuals. They're not, they're not all British, actually. They're all, inter it's one, it's a different lover from different countries. Um, but we know that the fifth lover will be Sidney Stencil, whom she does not yet actually meet in this chapter, the two are present uh, in the same set of events, but they don't actually uh, hook up. So, and uh, Herbert Stencil suspects possibly 
that V, remember, might be his mother, and it would have come from out of this series of events. And this, so we get uh, Evan Godolphin. Now, he shows up. Remember, Evan Godolphin was in uh, the, the chapter on Esther getting a nose job, was uh, Schoenmaker's uh, guy during World War I, the aviator that he looked up to, uh, that the plastic surgeon Halidom had worked on, reconstructing his face uh, with bits of the inanimate uh, that really pissed off Schoenmaker and made him want, want to become a, a more humanistic plastic surgeon, let's say. So this same Evan Godolphin now here, before the World War, this is back in 1899, uh, shows up and we meet his father, Hugh Godolphin. Uh, he has been called to Florence by his father uh, for a mysterious reason. His father happens to be one of these great explorers like uh, Roald Amundsen or uh, uh, Robert Scott. These types of guys who have gone to the Antarctic. Uh, Amundsen actually made it, uh, was the first to make it to the South Pole in 1911. Although uh, in this chapter, Godolphin will claim that he went there first actually in 1898, but didn't report it because of what he found there, which we'll see in a bit. Um, so he's one of these great explorers from the age of uh, what Peter Sloterdijk calls uh, in his book on In the World Interior of Capital, where he talks about how globalization is divided into three distinct phases. Uh, the early sort of earthly phase that extends from Aristotle to Dante, where the primary element is earth itself. Um, it's, and he calls it spheric ontological. Then the second phase of globalization for Sloterdijk kicks in. 1492, uh, and it goes all the way down to 1945. And during this age, this water begins to predominate over Earth. And so we see the old Ptolemaic maps, which are made up, depict the Earth mostly out of the element Earth, begin to shift and water comes in now. And we get the globe, the flat map extends into the globes that are first made, like the behind globe and so forth. Uh, in the um, 16th century, globes start coming in. And the anthropological type, uh, Sloterdijk says, of this age uh, is a disinhibiting type of consciousness that leads to the perpetrator. These guys are the explorers. They are perpetrators. This is perpetrator consciousness. Um, that is the anthro anthropological type of this age. And the primary means of, of, of movement are ships, boats and ships in, in movement. And so Hugh Godolphin belongs to this age, whereas Evan Godolphin belongs to Sloterdijk's third age, which doesn't begin technically... Uh, until 1945, uh, with uh, where the element then shifts with rockets and airplanes uh, from water to air for Sloterdijk. But already we know that Evan Godolphin is going to be a, a major aviator uh, during World War I, and so he represents uh, already the comings of the next generation of globalization, which is no longer, no, no longer uh, rather, uh, nautical, but it's, it's, it's aerospheric. Um, so Evan Godolphin uh, has showed up. He sees Victoria Wren walking down the street and he stands up and sings uh, a little bit of, of a piece of an aria from Mozart's Don Giovanni at her. It embarrasses her and she disappears. Um, and then she meets uh, his father, Hugh, uh, who's an old man at this point, um, who just sees that she's uh, British, she's not Italian, um, and she just she's going into a church and um, he comes up behind her and he says, I wish to confess something to you. And she says, oh, who are you? And he says, no, I'm just an old man, but I wish to, this is a place for confession, right? So I wish to confess something to you. And he says, do you know of a place where we can go? And she says, well, we can go out into the back patio. They have a garden back there behind the church and everything. So they go back. And then he tells her this strange story about how he discovered this place called Vihaisu. Um, now, this is, <laughs> this is a joke uh, of pensions because Vihaisu uh, is a is a, a pun on German, wie heißt du? What are you called? What's your name? Um, so it's wie heißt du, it's spelled V-H-E-I-S-S-U. Um, so it's what are you called, but it also, ref it could be read in a number of ways, commentators have su suggested. It could also be read as an anagram for V is us, or V is you, uh, referring to stencil that perhaps his, his fantasies regarding V are just that, fantasies. Uh, v is him. There's no reality to be whatsoever. Um, but this is a place, though, nonetheless, that uh, Godolphin has gone to on his explorations after he took part in the, the Khartoum events. He was there with the fight with the Mahdi and so forth. And then the next year, in 1884, they give him a land surveying uh, expedition. And he doesn't say where Vihaisu is. 
He just says that he describes this sort of jungle-like terrain. Uh, maybe it's in Tibet or something. It's up in a mountainous place where all the colors are iridescent and there are spider monkeys with iridescent coats. Everything changes into the, all these uh, astonishing different colors. Um, and for some reason, we don't know why, he just wants to confess this to someone. I don't. He doesn't know who Victoria Wren is or that she was connected with the Fashoda crisis or uh, espionage or anything of that nature. So he makes this confession to her and then um, she admires it. She, she's heard of him as an explorer. Uh, his name, Hugh, Hugh Godolphin, apparently is something, uh, he's a bit of a celebrity, uh, his, all of his expeditions. Uh, so she knows who, who he is. And then, so then it skips over to a, a secondary plot with this group uh, of guys, uh, Senor Mantissa, who's sitting, they're out s sitting in front of a wine shop, drinking some wine. Senor Mantissa and uh, Cesare, Cesare uh, the guy who's his cohort, um, they're waiting for a guy to show up named the Gaucho. And the Gaucho is from Caracas in Venezuelan, and he is there. Uh, to, little do they know that he is, has come there to foment po political uprising at the uh, Venezuelan consulate um, as he wishes to overthrow the government in Caracas. Um, so he has political ties. And so the gaucho shows up and he's a very rough, brazen character wearing a large sort of uh, what's called a wide away cap. It's floppy. Um, <clears throat> and they start talking about Machiavelli and Machiavelli's theory in the prince that they're the uh, politicians, princes should be either foxes or lions, and the fox is the one who uses the law and strategy and diplomacy. Uh, but Machiavelli says and recognizes that sometimes you have to resort to the lion, to force. Um, and the gaucho knows this, uh, as does Senor Mantissa, who is an esthete, um, who is there because he wants to, to steal the birth of Venus from the Uffizi, and both him and his cohort Cesare have enlisted the gaucho to help them. And the gaucho makes fun of their plans, and he tells them that I am your lion. And Mantessa says, I agree with that. My strategies are that of the fox. And then the gaucho looks over at Cesare and says, you're the pig. <laughs> Cesare is one of these earthly troll type characters. And he says, your plot is ridiculous. It isn't going to work. What we'll have to resort to is a bomb. And Senor Mantissa has an elegant mustache and he rubs it. And he's like, that wasn't exactly the way I would planned to do this. Uh, but he says, no, well, I'll hurl a grenade at, at the down the hall there and it will distract the people so that you can get in uh, because their plan is to, uh, because the painting is so large, they have to cut it out of its frame and then roll it up. And they've hollowed out a Judas tree, so they're going to put the painting inside of a Judas tree, um, which corresponds to the Virgin on the Western Wall of Chart in connection with the tree of Jesse. Uh, in a way, it's an allusion to that. And so that's the plan that these guys, three guys uh, have set up here. And then Evan Godolphin, meanwhile, is trying to figure out um, where to meet his father. And he's upstairs in his room and he finds a little case uh, that his father has left him a message inside of a rolled cigarette to meet him at Scheißvogels, uh, which is, translates to uh, Shitbird, <laughs> to meet him at Shitbird's beer garden, uh, which is yet another one of these German beer gardens that, that Pynchon has uh, that he's imported into uh, Italy, just like we saw the beer garden uh, in, in Cairo. And so they're going to meet there. But the Gaucho also uh, has his revolutionaries. He also plans later, all this takes place in one day. He also plans to meet his revolutionaries at Scheißvogel's beer garden. So it's, it's become a meeting place. And then, uh, but, but the, the authorities, the Italian authorities, as well as the British authorities there, and Sidney Stencil is here. Uh, he's, remember, he, he works as a spy for the British government. Uh, they all think that the Haisu uh, is code for Venezuela. Um, so they arrest Evan Godolphin and they take him back to his cell and eventually they arrest the gaucho as well and they take him to a cell. So they put the two guys in a cell and after interrogating them, Sidney Stencil interrogates Evan Godolphin and realizes that Vihaiso might actually be a real place. It has nothing to do with Venezuela. So he sends a note to uh, central office in London and they tell him to forget about the whole thing and let Godolphin go. He has nothing to do with Venezuela. They also let the gaucho go. And so the gaucho is let out um, and uh, they go to uh, good Gadrolfi's the florist uh, who is preparing the Judas tree for them, for Senor Mantissa and Cesare, and they get the, uh, the, the Judas tree. And then uh, Victoria Wren decides uh, she's beginning to develop a taste for espionage here. And so she wants to connect with these people. She's heard Hugh Godolphin's story 
uh, who has escaped and he's on his way. He joins up with Senor Mantissa. As it turns out, the two know each other and have a history going back. So they decide they're going to go to the beer garden as well, Scheiss Vogels. And uh, the note for, that has been left to Evan from Hugh is to go meet him at Scheiss Vogels. Uh, but first, Victoria Wren intercepts Evan as he is released from jail. She wants to meet the son. And so they talk for a bit and flirt a bit. And Evan thinks that she has more interest in him than she really does. Um, but she doesn't. And then so they go to Scheiss Vogels and uh, they meet up. With, uh, Evan meets up with his father. And then Senor Mantissa is there. Uh, the gaucho is not there yet. He's, he's busy uh, gathering up his revolutionaries to start shooting in the streets in front of the Venezuelan consulate. Uh, to cause all this chaos, but he's still willing to throw the bomb in the museum if they want to get the birth of Venus out, which is Senor Mantis's obsession. And Hugh Godolphin tells him about his journey to the South Pole, which uh, Pynchon dates 1898, uh, but this never really happened, of course. Amund Amundsen didn't get there until 1911. Uh, this would have been one year earlier. And um, so he tells Senor Mantis, so I went to the South Pole, um, and I was the only guy who survived the expedition, and I made it there, and I planted the flag there, uh, the British flag. But you know what I saw there? I, I saw, um, I, I dug beneath the ice, and I saw, this is right at the South Pole, uh, I saw a spider monkey, a frozen, iridescent spider monkey. Um, and he had remembered the iridescent spider monkeys that he had seen in the land of Vies, of, of Vihaisu. And uh, so he doesn't understand the connection, but it really freaks him out, and it's traumatized him. Uh, it's, a, it's a symbol of meaninglessness, whereas Dante, when he goes down to the center of the earth, he finds at the South Pole there, uh, Satan turned upside down with his three faces. Uh, he finds a meaningful image, but in postmodernity, it's almost as though uh, Hugh Godolphin's quest for meaning is totally mocked by the appearance at the South Pole of a spider monkey, uh, so he fails to report it to anyone. And so uh, he simply confesses this to Senor Mantissa. They move ahead with their plot then to go into the museum, Mantissa and Cesare. Um, they get up in there. Um, the gaucho hurls the bomb at the gallery. And as Cesare is about to cut, Mantissa says, stop, don't do it. I can't do it. She's too beautiful. I can't. Uh, there's, there's no way I can, I can do this. So Venus has been his obsession, uh, just as V is Stencil's obsession, and just as V. Haisu has been Hugh Godolphin's obsession. They're all obsessed with things that begin with the letter V uh, that orbit around V, the muse, goddess of Western uh, civilization. So he says, no, leave her on the wall. We'll just leave. So they all meet up at a boat. Uh, everyone gets on the boat, except for Cesare. He's, he's local. And Victoria Wren does not go. Uh, Sidney Stencil shows up uh, while the uprising is going on and they're shooting in the streets. And the gaucho flees along with the Senor Mantissa and Hugh Godolphin and Evan Godolphin. And so that's it. Um, for this chapter, um, Evan Godolphin will later meet with V uh, once again in a completely different set of circumstances in a much darker locale and under much darker conditions having to do with genocide in South Africa. Um, <clears throat> so that's this chapter, and uh, it's a wonderful chapter. It reads like a, a, a miniature, a novel in miniature. And uh, so then uh, the next chapter we'll give back to Benny Profane, and we'll, we'll see what has happened to him.